If you're here with us last week, we looked at Luke 6 and we examined what Jesus taught about the relationship between our hearts and our actions. And we learned two principles that are really, really important for us to understand if we're really going to make lasting, godly life change. And that's what this series is about. And so number one was that whatever rules your heart exercises inescapable influence on your life and behavior. Whatever rules your heart exercises inescapable influence on your life and behavior. Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the overflow of the heart, the wallet spins. Out of the overflow of the heart, the eyes look. Okay? So that was our first principle. And then we looked at that principle in reverse. Okay? So if my heart rules my behavior, then looking, by looking at my behavior, I can learn something about what's controlling my heart. We tend to want to blame uh, other people and circumstances, people, things outside of us for our behavior. But because our heart controls our behavior, that's simply not true. And so the second principle we saw from Luke 6 was that people and situations do not determine my behavior. They only give an opportunity to show what's already in my heart. And my actions at any given moment, your behavior at any given moment, are a, it serves as a window into what's controlling your heart. And since the beginning of this series, we've been really trying to answer two questions. Why do people do what they do? And then how do people change? Why do people do what they do? And how do people change? And so today is where we're finally going to get the answer to both of those questions. And if I can just be honest, this week's message and the one that follows it in this series really serve as the backbone, the key to this entire series. If I could condense this entire series down into two sermons, it would be this one and the next one. Okay? And so we're really close. We just need clarity on one more issue, and then we'll have an answer to these two questions. We've said that our hearts control our behavior. But we have one final question to answer. And what, what, what controls our heart? See, we, we've taken our behaviors. We've kind of got behind that and said, okay, it's the heart. But what controls the heart? So we need to take one more step back and understand what's working in the heart, what controls the heart, so we can understand what ultimately controls our behavior. When we understand that, we'll really have some clarity on how it is that we need to make change. So... That's what we're going to do in Matthew 6, and I just want to ask God to help us um, understand this text this morning, ask Him to help me as I preach this text and guard me from saying anything that would be unfaithful to His Word. So uh, would you pray with me? God, thank You for allowing us to come and study the Word. Thank You so much for Christ and who He is for us. Thank You for the promises of the Gospel. Thank You for the identity that we have in His person work on our behalf. And God, I pray now that you would help us see and savor your son Jesus in this text. I pray that you would guard my mouth. And that I would only say things that are faithful and true and accurately represent your word. And in the event that I say something that's not correct, that it would quickly fall away. So we ask that you would do this for your glory. Amen. Matthew 6. Verse 19, here we go. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But, verse 20, lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Verse 24. No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. So few truths we need to see in this text today. Number one, everyone has a treasure. 
everyone has a treasure. You notice last week we saw the same language in Luke chapter 6, where the, there's good treasure in the heart and bad treasure in the heart, and that good treasure produces good behavior, and that bad treasure produces bad behavior. But notice, there's no scenario where there's not a treasure. We're always treasuring something. In fact, verse 21 right here, for where your treasure is, not if you have one, but for where it is, you do have one, there your heart will be also. Have you ever noticed that you want to be happy? I mean, I know it's like obvious, but I mean, have you ever thought about that? It's a universal human desire. Across every culture, everywhere, people seek satisfaction. People want joy and pleasure. They, they want those things. You want those things. Every single person seeks after those things. Have you ever asked yourself why? I mean, mosquitoes don't do that. Worms don't do that. Why do we seek after joy and satisfaction? And the answer is, it's because that's how you were created. The fact that we want to be happy, that we want joy, is, it's not a mistake. It's how we were designed. Which means that by our very nature, we're always seeking joy and satisfaction in one way or another. There's not a single person in this room here that's not ultimately searching after that. In all your work, in all your play, all your sacrifices, you do it. Because in one way or another, whether in the short term or the long term, you believe that it will contribute to your ultimate joy and happiness. That's why we do what we do. The reason some people break the rules and other people keep the rules, the reason some people save their money and other people spend their money, the reason some people exercise and the reason some people don't exercise is ultimately the same reason. You believe that by doing those things, you will move yourself one step closer towards what you perceive as being abundant life. The the man, for example, the man who sits on the couch and just plays video games versus the workaholic are ultimately searching after the same thing, attended by two different paths. One is seeking abundant life, as in a life of extreme comfort and ease with no responsibility. The other, abundant life, is a life of productivity and achievement and money and perhaps the respect and power that comes With it. Two completely different approaches, both attempts to satisfy that same desire for meaning, satisfaction, and purpose. Blaise Pascal, as a Christian philosopher, said this All men seek happiness. This is without exception. Whatever different means they employ, they all tend to this end. The cause of some going to war and others avoiding it is the same desire in both, attended with different views. The will never takes the least step but to this object, satisfaction. This is the motive of every action of every man, even those who hang themselves. Even the person who tragically ends their own life does so because they, and I would add mistakenly, wrongly, believe that ceasing to live would be better than continuing to live. Even in that moment, they're doing what they understand will bring them a better life situation than if they didn't act that way. Everything that we do, in one way or another, we do because we believe it will provide us with a joy and satisfaction that we wouldn't otherwise get. Which means this. Everything we do is in some way self-interested. doesn't mean it's selfish. It means that everything we do is in some way self-interested. And that's not bad. Let me tell you why. The reason it's not that bad is that from the beginning, you and I were created to be worshipers. From the beginning, you and I were created to be worshipers. So here's, here's what that means. You and I were created with desires for joy and pleasure, and we were created to do something with those desires. We were created 
to satisfy those desires in some object, in something. We're supposed to do something, to take those desires to something or to someone. And from the very beginning, that object was God. Adam and Eve were designed to find abundant life and satisfaction in God himself. Okay, The Garden of Eden was a place of pleasure. Eden in the Hebrew means delight. It's the Garden of Delight. And it's not just because it had good-looking fruit. It's because it's, it was where the, the glory of God dwelt. It's where he put his presence. And Adam and Eve enjoyed fellowship with the omnipotent, wise, merciful, gracious, glorious God of the universe. In His presence, they prospered for a second. That's what, we, that's what they were created for, though. In His presence, Psalm 1611 says, In His presence there is fullness of joy. At His right hand there are pleasures forevermore. This is what you were made for. Joy that's full, pleasure that never ends. We tend to think of pleasure like it's a dirty word. Like you need to be embarrassed about that. Don't be. You were created for joy and pleasure. It's not wrong to want that. And you were created to find that in God. And you ask, well, why don't we find that in God? Well, because something really bad happened in Genesis chapter 3 called sin. And as a result, our beliefs and our desires have been distorted. Right? So, so we don't desire God like we should, and we don't believe um, the things about God that we should. But we question whether or not God um, wants the best for us. We question whether or not He really wants us to be happy and have an abundant life. We question whether or not His design for our lives really is for ultimate satisfaction. And because of sin, we now look to other things to give us the satisfaction that only God can. Because of sin in the world, we now look to other things to give us the satisfaction that only God can. So, watch this with me. We still desire joy and pleasure. That hasn't changed. Like, you and I are still joy seekers. What's changed is our beliefs about where we can find it. Whereas in Eden, our craving for pleasure and joy was fulfilled in God himself now we still have that desire for satisfaction and joy, and we ask our jobs, children, spouses, respect, sex, money, and success to give it to us. In fact, even G.K. Chesterton said this, even the man knocking on the door of a brothel is seeking for God. He's seeking happiness. He's seeking pleasure. He's hoping to have some meaningful interaction to fill some void in his heart. But it won't work. I love how Augustine uh, said it. He said, Thou hast made us for thyself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it finds its rest in thee. Before we... Move on. I want us to just take a second and ask ourselves that question. What do you find your rest in? Like, what is the thing that you look to for satisfaction in life? I'm not talking about what you believe. Here, let's let's put those over here for a second. What is the thing that you look to to make this life meaningful, to make you feel? What keeps you warm at night? What's the thing that gives you joy in this life? In fact, I've even given a few questions here to help you understand this. We're really trying to understand what is your treasure? That's what, that's what all those words mean. What, what is your treasure? I don't want anyone to answer out loud or anything like that. You don't even have to fill in a blank. I'm just going to ask you these three questions and I want you to think about them. I'm going to give you a few minutes just to think. Fill in the blank for yourself. If only blank then I would be truly happy. What is that for you? How about this? Blank gives me my sense of self-worth and value. Blank gives me my sense of worth or self-worth and value. What is that? Is your is it your parenting? Is it your physical looks? Is it your bank account? 
Is it the respect of your peers? I mean, well, what is it? Just be honest. How about this? If I lost blank, life might not be worth living anymore. What is that for you? Because whatever it is, that's your treasure. That's what you're living for. That's what you worship. And it's really, that's really, really hard to admit. And last week we said that if you don't know you've been forgiven, you're not going to be able to admit that. It's only when you know that you're covered by God's grace that you can feel free to really answer those questions honestly and not have to fill them in with the Christian answers you know are correct. If, I, if only I had more Jesus, then I'd be happy. If Jesus gives me, okay. I mean, if you're really being honest and filling these in, you're really going to have some very helpful insight into what's going on in your heart. And you can only have that insight if you've examined your heart deep enough. And you can only examine your heart deep enough if you know you've already been forgiven of all the sin you find there. So we're, we're trying to examine our hearts to see what our heart treasures. Why? Because point number two, your treasure rules your heart. Your treasure rules your heart. Look at the text with me. Verse 21. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The thing that I look to for joy and satisfaction in life is what rules my heart. Okay? He, he continues in 22 to 23. He, he makes a similar point. Uh, that Luke made last week. The eye is the lamp of the body. Here, here eye is, is kind of functioning like the heart, essentially. And so if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. The analogy here is, as goes my heart, so goes my life. That's what we talked about last week. But then he circles back around to this idea of desires and affections in verse 24. Watch this. No one can serve two masters. Here's the, here's the emotional language right here. For he will either... Uh, he, either he will hate, there's one, the one, and love, there's two, the other. Or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. So this is really interesting because it gives us an insight into what Jesus understands love to be. What does he say you can't, you know, love money? What does it mean to love money? Money. This, this is really, really. Does it mean that? Um, does Jesus have the idea that people are going home and petting their money or saying, "I love you, I love you, money"? No, 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 no. Again, love is not seen in what you say. He has the idea that people are looking to their money to give them their hope for tomorrow, and their sense of value and worth, and their sense of joy, and their sense of satisfaction, and their sense of security. And in many cases, he'd be right. A lot of people look there. And he's saying that that's, that's what your treasure is. That's what you're worshiping. The thing that you look to for that joy and satisfaction, that's what you love. You can say you love God all you want to. You can say it a thousand times. But, it, but at the end of the day, if the things that you treasure, the things that satisfy you, the things that you hope in, to make your life meaningful and abundant, if that's not God, then you do not love God like you should. You, you, you may believe in God, kind of like you believe 2 plus 2 equals 4, like an intellectual fact, but yeah, I believe in God. In fact, you may even be thankful for God because He makes your eternity better. You don't want to go to hell, right? But where God is, is not loved, He's not treasured. And if God's not what you treasure, He's not what you live for. Which is a problem, because what you love determines what you live. What you love determines what you live. Verse 24 makes an explicit connection between the love, the thing you love, and the thing that you are devoted to, and the thing you serve. What you love determines what you live. And it's in this realization that we have the answer to the first question we've been trying to answer in this series. Why do people do what they do? Why do people do what they do? Answer? Because they have a treasure that serves as the source of their satisfaction and joy, and that treasure rules their hearts, and whatever rules your heart rules your behavior. 
Think about it this way. Three parts. A hand, a steering wheel, and a car. The power to turn the wheel comes from my hand. As goes my hand, so goes the wheel. And as goes the wheel, so goes the car. And in the same way, as goes my desires and treasures and the things I look to for satisfaction, so goes my heart. And as goes my heart, so goes my life. Unfortunately for us, God specializes in providing sinners with new hearts. Not just new habits, new hearts. Okay. Last week we looked at Ezekiel 36 and saw that God comes to us and takes out our heart of stone and puts in its place a heart of flesh and puts His Spirit in us and moves us to obey Him, which means this. Listen to me. If you're a believer in this room today, even if you are struggling right now with a certain sin, If you're a believer, the Holy Spirit is doing battle with that sin and gradually taking back ground, gradually causing you to treasure Christ and hate your sin. And you can be confident that in the grand scheme of things, when it comes to your sin, the Holy Spirit will win the war. But that does not mean that your flesh will not lose some battles along the way. Why? Because the Spirit is willing, but the flesh is what? Weak. Spirit's willing, but the flesh is weak. So there's this objective sense in which believers are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is reigning in the hearts of believers. But there's a subjective sense in which there's still this battle, that on this side of eternity, there's still a battle raging in our hearts. In fact, you have in your notes there. We have competing desires in our hearts that wage war against one another. We have competing desires in our hearts that wage war against one another. This is the language the Bible uses to describe what's going on in your heart at any given time, at any given moment. Look at it in Galatians 5. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires, there it is, of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit. Desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. Some of you here today, you're like, I know exactly what he's talking about. I mean, you have this bucket over here of righteous and godly desires and intentions and promises and all this stuff. And you have this bucket over here of sinful pleasures. And gosh, when you wake up in the morning, you, you, you say with Paul in Romans 7, 21, whenever I want to do good, evil is right there with me. It's like, oh, these desires are tugging in your heart. Like you want to serve the Lord, but you want to do this over here. It's a battle. Look how James talks about it. He asks this question, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you in your marriage, in your relationship, in your friendships? What causes quarrels and what causes fights? Is it not this? Your passions are at war within you. You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. And you ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. Listen, guys, the battle for personal holiness is a battle for your affections. It's a battle for your desires, the thing that satisfies you. And we will always, this is really important, we will always move towards the thing that we love the most in any given moment. Whatever's ruling our heart in any given moment is what's going to determine our behavior. Give me an example of this real quick. I want you to pretend that this right here is of my heart. Move these just a little bit closer. This is the throne of my heart. And each one of these steps represents a desire I have in my life. Now, let's pretend we're talking about, let's say, a girl who's in high school, maybe a student. And um, she's at school, and she's a really good student. She's looking to get a scholarship to, to like an Ivy League school. Okay, and so she values, um, she values learning, maybe like right here. And then maybe in her heart, another thing, she likes, she likes success. She wants to make money and like be really good at her job. But of course, right now, she's got a boyfriend, all right, and uh, that's like really big in her heart. But she also loves Jesus, okay? And um, so Jesus is sitting on the throne of her heart. I'm going to so you guys can hopefully see. All right, and so look, here. here 
Just a picture of a heart right here. We've got multiple desires and kind of things that we want more than others. And Christ is satisfying me. He's sitting on the throne of my heart. And this girl goes in to take this big exam. Okay, this is huge, right? I mean, it's going to determine whether she gets the scholarship to this Ivy League school. And she gets to a point in the exam where she doesn't know a question. It's like a 20-point question. She's like, oh, man. And she starts to think, if I miss this question, I may not get the scholarship. She starts to think, what am I going to do? And in that moment, this starts to creep up a little bit. I don't want to be broken homeless. I want to have a good salary and a good life. If I don't get this test, I don't get the right grade on this test, I'm not going to get into college that I want. If I don't get into the college that I want, I may not have the career that I want. Huge things are at stake here. So she's nervous about this question, and then she looks over on the paper of the girl sitting next to her who's a straight-A student as well. She marked B on her paper, and she sees that this girl over here marked A. 20 points at stake, potential scholarship at stake. And in that moment, it's not that she stops loving Jesus, guys. It's that in that moment, what rules her heart is her craving for success. And she erases that B, marks A. And turns it in. Let's rewind the tape and play it back the other way, right? So let's just say that in that moment, Christ is reigning on the throne of her heart. She treasures him and his grace and his mercy. She sees her identity not in performance and achievement in life. She sees her identity in light of Christ's love for her and his work for her. And she gets to that question. She says, God, you give and take away. I don't know. But a scholarship is not worth sinning for. And she turns in her army and doesn't cheat it. See? That's what happens. In that moment, whatever's ruling her heart in that moment is going to determine her behavior. Now, not many of you are students, so I thought I'd give one more example um, that maybe hit a little, might hit a little closer to home. Okay? Let's say dad's at work, right? And he definitely doesn't go to work because it's comfortable, but he likes comfort. He does that like on Saturdays and Sundays. He goes to work because he needs to make money to provide for his family, Right? Okay, and then uh, he, he loves his family. All right, so that's really close to the top of his heart. But then, because he loves Jesus, Jesus is on the throne of his heart. Right? You see these desires here? Okay, there's kind of a hierarchy of desires. And let's say dad goes to work, okay, and man, his boss just gets on him the second he walks in the door, and he's like, man, this day is over for me. I, I can't wait to just get home and prop my feet up and relax. Okay, so suddenly... This right here starts to climb up the ladder. And then he gets in his car on the way home and he oh, just lets his tie down a little bit. He's like, oh, yes, turns on some music. Like, can't wait to hit that recliner when I get home. I'm almost there. It's going to be great, right? And so here's this desire. You can see it creeping up in his heart, okay? This is, this is how behavior works, right? Okay, and then he gets and he, he, he's pulling into his driveway. He's like, oh, I cannot wait to walk in this house. No one's going to ask me for anything. No one's going to demand anything of me, okay? No one's going to ask me any questions, ask me to explain about my day. Nothing. I'm going to go straight to the recliner. I'm just going to kick back. And you get there. Uh, he gets in there, and he sees that recliner and just makes a straight line to it. Now, at this point, he has to have it. And because this has began to reign in his heart, this has started, sorry, to, to reign in his heart, when his kids come up and say, Dad, I want you to do this, and wife says, hey, honey, can you talk to me about this? He says, hey, I need peace and quiet. I just worked a long day. I, I need some me time, okay? Everyone just settle down. I'll be with you later. Because this was reigning in his heart. It doesn't mean he doesn't love Jesus. What it means is in that moment, the pleasure of comfort was was better than the pleasure of serving and loving his family in the way that Christ has served and loved him. But look, let's rewind the tape. What, what if had he gotten in his driveway and he realized that this was coming really close to being an idol and he stopped and he prayed and said, God, the last thing I really want to do right now is go, go in this house and sacrifice my comfort for my family. 
But Christ's sacrifice is comfort for me, and I pray that you would give me the grace to do the same for the ones you've called me to shepherd. And then this changes. And he goes in the house, and he answers the questions, and he serves, and then he says, Hey, guys, I had a really long day, and I really do want to interact with you. Is there a time, either now or later, that I could have some time alone just to kind of unwind a little bit? Totally different. Totally different. And it had everything to do with what was ruling in his heart in that moment. What you treasure rules your heart. And what rules your heart controls your life. So if you haven't guessed it by now, if you want to change your life, you have to change your treasure. If what you treasure controls your heart, and what controls your heart controls your life, then if you want to change your life and behavior, you need to change your treasure. If you make real life change, you're going to have to change the thing that satisfies you. You're going to have to change the thing that you look to to give you meaning and person, uh, purpose and joy in this life. And you can't do it by just trying to willpower this thing. You know what? I'm just going to suppress all my desires to be happy. You can't. It's impossible because you are by nature a joy seeker. The only, the only way to do this is to find something that satisfies you more than your current treasure. It's the idea that what gives us the power to stop one thing and start something else is the belief and experience that the new thing is more satisfying than the old thing, that it's better. We need what Thomas Chalmers uh, called the expulsive power of a new affection. We need the expulsive power of a new affection. Let me illustrate this. Let's say that your dog, like mine used to do, keeps eating the cat food. And I would come to Snoopy and say, Snoopy, stop eating the cat food. Stop eating the cat food. Right? I'm telling him the right thing, but it's not working. Been there? I have. I know what I'm supposed to do. Just not doing it. Snoopy, stop. He won't. What I do then is I take a steak off the grill. And I lower it down there. Come here, buddy. And he runs to that steak. Why? It's not because he doesn't like the cat food anymore. It's because he's found something better. He's still just as hungry. He's just found a better option. What caused him to move away from the cat food is not me telling him no. It's me giving him something better. And that treasure in his heart, whatever, um, was what it took to get him away from that cat food. Let me give you a, a little more serious example. I knew uh, a couple who was really struggling with smoking. Like, they just wanted to stop smoking. And they had tried for years and years and years to stop smoking. Okay? They're like, they had made promises, and they tried the patch and the gum, and they tried a thousand things. Okay. And they just couldn't do it. All right. Um, well, their daughter got married, and this, um, particular, this particular mom and, and, and dad, they both wanted to be grandparents. And, in fact, as soon as her, their daughter got married, they started talking about grandkids. We're going to have grandkids. We're going to have grandkids yet? We want to be a grandma and grandpa. And I'll never forget when this girl was telling me the story. She went up to her mom and, and said, uh, Mom, I mean, y'all, y'all smoke all in the house. And I mean, they didn't even go outside, just sit right in the recliner. And I just want to tell you, that your grandson is never going to come over here if you keep smoking. Because it's hard to breathe in here. I can't bring my baby boy into this. They quit two weeks later. <laughs> they quit two weeks later. They got a deionizer to make the house smell better. Why? What happened? Now think about what happened here. They had tried for years to stop smoking. And suddenly they just quit. How? Because they got a better treasure. They were looking for something for satisfaction and pleasure, and they just found something better, and now they wanted that instead. And it's that new treasure that changed their behavior. New treasure changes their behavior. When it comes to our hearts, that treasure is Christ. The only thing that is powerful enough to dethrone the pleasure of sin in our hearts 
is the superior pleasure of Christ. The way that you fight sinful pleasure is with godly pleasure, something better. The way that you fight the cat food is with the steak. I often ask people this. How much do you enjoy Jesus? I'm not asking how much you serve, how much you obey. No, no, no. How much do you enjoy him? And I'm blown away that most people don't have a category for this. They're like, well, I don't really enjoy it. I'm, I'm thankful for Jesus. I give money to Jesus. I obey Jesus. But I don't know that I enjoy Jesus. And this is where we've missed it so often in the church. I think we've done a great job teaching people that Jesus died for their sins, to save them from hell. If you've been in the church, you've heard that message before, probably. That Jesus died on the cross to save you from your sins. Okay? That Jesus is a Savior to be thanked. But we have done a poor job of teaching people that Jesus is a satisfier to be enjoyed. And as a result, we have a lot of people in the church who are really grateful but few who are very happy. Genuinely thankful for what Jesus did then, but few who are very happy them now. And if you only see that Christ offers salvation then, but fail to see the satisfaction He offers now, you will struggle to see how he relates to your Check, check. So we're like, yeah, I get it. Okay, like I'm really thankful that Jesus died on the cross. Look forward to when he comes back in heaven. But what do I do for the next 60 years? Like what does he do for me But like in between? I mean, I'm thankful, looking forward to then, thankful for then. But what does Jesus do for me now? Well, this is not going to work, is it? Because the reality is, Christ is more than a Savior to be thanked. He is a satisfier to be enjoyed. Christ is more than a Savior to be thanked. He is a satisfier to be enjoyed. Look, you can't live the Christian life on the fuel of pure gratitude alone. Thankfulness is not enough. It's important. Don't be less than thankful. Be more than thankful. Don't be less than thankful. But gratitude is not enough to live this Christian life on. And the good news is, folks, you don't have to. Because Christ is a satisfier. Psalm 17, 15, as for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness. When I awake, I shall be satisfied with your lightness. Psalm 34, 8, oh, taste and see. Don't stand, stand uh, far away and believe. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Psalm 36, 7 and 8, how precious is your steadfast love, O God. The children of mankind take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They Feast on the abundance of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your delights. Psalm 90, 14. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love, that we may rejoice and be glad all, all our days. Psalm 27, 4. One thing have I asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Proverbs 19, 23. The fear of the Lord leads to life, and whoever has it rests satisfied. Psalm 73, 25, whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Why? Because in your presence, Psalm 16, 11, there is fullness of joy. And at your right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. Paul knew this. That's why he said in Philippians 3, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, 
I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. He said to live as Christ and to die as gain. Gain. He loses his friends. He loses his reputation, his comfort, his family. He loses his own life. And if he gets Jesus, he chalks that up to gain. Because Jesus himself said in John 10, 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. And I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Friends, contrary to popular opinion, the invitation to follow Jesus is not some instruction to abandon your pursuit of joy and pleasure. It's a command to find it in its fullest, most potent form. It's not suppressing your craving for satisfaction. It's an invitation to drink directly from the fountain of satisfaction itself. It's no coincidence that Nehemiah said the joy of the Lord is your strength. Because it's the joy of the Lord. It's pleasures in Christ. His beauty. That's going to be the only thing powerful enough to dethrone the sinful desires that compete for control of our hearts. And when that happens, when the joy of the Lord rules your heart, then the Lord rules your life. Which means then that our only hope for life change is to delight ourselves in the Lord. Our only hope for life change is to delight ourselves in the Lord. Psalm 37, 4. Delight yourself in the Lord. And he will give you the desires of your heart. Lest you think this was just some interesting philosophy, God commands you to be joyful in him. You should make it one of your chief pursuits every day to be joyful in him, delighting yourself in him. Not just delighting yourself in general, but delighting yourself in him. That's why we're studying the word right now. I'm hoping I'm fanning the flames of your affections for Christ. That's why we sing songs. We're trying to take that truth and with the music, shove it down into our hearts so that we experience it, so that we taste and see. That's why we spend time in prayer to build our affections and desires for Christ, that treasure of the heart. He satisfies me. He's my portion. That's why we take the Lord's Supper. It's a taste and see, treasure in Christ in our hearts and our affections. That's what this means. Delight yourself in the Lord And I will give you the desires of your heart means if you delight in me, I'll give you myself. If your delight is me, then your desires are going to be for me. So he says, if you delight yourself in me, I'll give you myself. And I'll be honest, there was a time in my life where I was kind of disappointed with that. Because I thought this verse was a way to get what you wanted. Right? Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. So I was like, okay, God, I'm delighting in you. Can I have all these other things now? Hey, God, I'm delighting in you. Can you give me what I really delight in? And I was the one that was missing out. I was the one that was asking for cat food when he had offered me a steak. C.S. Lewis said it this way. It would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong but too weak. We're half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition When infinite joy is offered to us, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he can't imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea, we are far too easily pleased. Far too easily pleased. Friends, stop snacking on the worldly crumbs of satisfaction and pleasure that we try to find in a variety of places and feast yourself on the abundant life that is Christ Jesus. Because it's only then that he's going to rule in your heart. And it's only then that he's going to rule in your life. Don't forget, in his presence, there's fullness of joy. Joy that can't be more full. At his right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. And when you experience that, and when you taste and see that he's good, then you can say truly in your heart, in the morning, When I rise, give me Jesus. Let's pray. God, thank you so much that you have come to us, not just to save us from our sin, but to satisfy our deepest desires. God, every person in this room wants joy and happiness. 
every person in this room desires pleasure. Everyone in this room wants meaning and purpose. And all of us look to a variety of things to give us that. We're like children who just want to keep making mud pies when you've given us infinite joy in yourself. We're taking sips from the world when you've given us an ocean in yourself. And God, I pray for those across this room who are struggling to see. Maybe they've never even thought about delighting in you. Maybe they just thought of you as kind of like a coach who's just disappointed in them, wants you to behave correctly. Maybe a judge, some frustrated, grumpy old father. God, I pray that you would help people see that's not who you are. You say in Zephaniah 3 that you exult over us with loud singing. That we're treasured and honored in your heart. And so, God, I ask that now across this room, you would fill us with that abundant life that's in Christ Jesus. That you would excite our affections and our desires. That he would be the treasure of our hearts so that we might live for his glory. God, satisfy us today with your steadfast love. Give us the fullness of joy that's in your presence. Let us taste the pleasures that are at your right hand. Let us drink from the river of your delights. Let us gaze upon your beauty in your sanctuary.